Hello, and welcome to my basement for DockerCon 2021. Um, my name is Michael Irwin. I am coming to you from uh, Virginia in the United States, and I work at Virginia Tech, and I'm excited to be here with you to talk about right once deploy everywhere using configuration. So configure to deploy everywhere. And uh, this should be a pretty fun talk, but um, I'm going to start off with a lot of theory and kind of the principles of it. And then we'll actually dive into some uh, demo applications and deployments and, and how to, to see this actually pan out. In many ways, this is a getting back to the basics talk, to, to talk about some of the fundamentals and some of the underlying principles. And I recognize for many of you, this may be things that you already know about. But for many others, especially if you're new to the container world, this might be pretty beneficial. So hopefully uh, you'll be able to follow along and it, it shouldn't be too advanced anyways. So when, when Docker first uh, made their first website and granted they had a little bit before this but this is one of the earliest websites they had this uh, catchphrase of build ship and run any app anywhere and even as of uh, just earlier this month their website had this tagline accelerate how you build share and run modern applications and so really this idea of being able to package up a container and then run it anywhere is super super powerful but I often hear things like this. I'm going to deploy to Kubernetes or to ECS or to fill in the blank. So that must mean I need to develop using Kubernetes or ECS or Swarm or whatever, fill in the blank, right? Well, when I hear that, I immediately think of just a rocket crashing and burning because Kubernetes and ECS, these deployment frameworks aren't really designed for local development. And hopefully, as, as we talk about this a little bit more, you'll you'll come to understand. In many ways, I see this as a parallel to something like this. If I'm shipping my goods via rail, you know, on a train, that must mean I need to pack them on a rail car, right? Well, it's a similar situation. A rocket just crashing and burning. Okay, so why, why do I feel this way? I actually did quite a bit of research uh, in preparation for this talk and learned about a lot of the standards of shipping containers, of intermodal containers. Each corner of a shipping container uh, meets the specifications of ISO 1161 and it defines the fitting and the size and the dimensions and the weight capacity and everything for these uh, these corner castings. The casting has an oval shape on the bottom where then what's called a twist lock will fit into the oval and then it twists and because the, the, the hole is an oval when it twists it can no longer come out of it. Okay, and it prevents escape. And what we see down here, let me grab the uh, laser pointer. And so this is an example of one of the, the, the castings. And what happens is it slides on this, they twist the twist lock, and then it locks it in place. But a container has four of these on the bottom, four of these on the top, and allows them to stack the, the containers as, as high as they want to go, okay? In the, the shipping industry, these are seen all over the place. Um, so in trucks, for example, that move them around, you can attach a shipping container to a truck and it's got a twist lock to attach the container to the truck. And in fact, I was just looking at some uh, interesting statistics. Over the last 10 to 15 years, the number of shipping containers that have um, that are going across US railway anyways, have increased dramatically. And I saw in, in several reports, including this one, uh, that uh, one of the big reasons for that is because now they can stack these things two, two containers high, where in the past in the past where they were using trailers they couldn't stack the trailers, and so they're actually able to move more goods uh, using containers. And so it's kind of interesting to hear of software containers continuing to take off, and yet in many ways shipping containers are are still continuing to take off, um, especially here in the United States, anyways. But so when we think of ISO 1611 for corner castings, what are the similar standards for software containers? Okay, Some of these standards, actually most of these, are defined by what are what's called the Open Container Initiative, or OCI. And a lot of this work was spun out of a lot of the early work of, of Docker, and, and Docker really tried to make open standards that would help the industry standardize on things, so not everybody has a different version of what's a container and what's an image. Um, so OCI defines an image specification, a runtime specification, as of just a couple weeks ago, a distribution specification as well for the API endpoints for a registry, et cetera. Um, while there are many OCI compliant runtimes, the one that gets probably the most use is called Container D. 
And again, we're not going to spend a lot of time talking at, at this low level, but it's important to understand that there are standards at, at play here. Um, and Container D is, is a CNCF graduated project, which is pretty awesome. Um, so who's using Container D? Pretty much anybody that you're going to be interacting with. Um, so the Docker engine has been using it for many, many years since the um, 111 release, which if I check my speaker notes real quick, that was in April 2016, so a long time ago. Um, Fargate is using Container D under the hood. The IBM Cloud Container Engine, the Google Container Engine, they're all using Container D. Um, Kubernetes, I think a lot of people heard the fiasco. Oh my goodness, Kubernetes is killing Docker. No, they're just switching to the Container D shim, which had been planned all along to, again, start up containers and, and deploy them in a much lighter weight version or uh, format. Okay, so Container D gets a lot of mileage, a lot of usage. Okay. So what are some of these specifications? I want to talk specifically about configuring applications. If you haven't heard of the 12-factor app, I would highly encourage you to, to check it out. Um, it's at 12factor.net, and it has 12 different principles on how to build cloud-native applications so that your application can be portable. And just to note, this was written before containers were really a thing. Um, but anyways, one of those principles, one of those tenants, one of those factors is called config. And they define config as such. An app's config is everything that is likely to vary between deploys, so between staging, production, developer environments, etc. A litmus, a litmus test for whether an app has all config correctly factored out of the code is whether the code base could be made open source at any moment without compromising any credentials. And I know for some of us that could be a scary thought. But again, what's varying? What are our secrets? What are our, our credentials? That's config. Okay. One of the things that I will also um, break it down a little bit is configuration is composed of two main ideas here. And, and you'll see this get represented a lot, especially the container orchestration systems. Um, and so we'll see this come up a, a little bit later as well. So again, config encompasses anything that might vary. And a lot of times what you hear is config, and then you'll hear secrets. And a lot of times people are like, what's the difference? Okay, Think of secrets as anything that's sensitive, so database credentials, API keys, et cetera. While config is, again, everything that will vary. Yes, your API keys and your database credentials may certainly rotate, but they're a little more sensitive. And so they need to be handled maybe with a little bit more care. So a, a good kind of graphical representation or secrets are a subset of your overall config because they're still varying uh, based on deploy, but they need to be treated a little bit differently. And so and we'll we'll talk about that in just a little bit. Okay. So one of the things that the 12-factor app talks about is environment variables. It says the 12-factor app stores config in environment variables, often shortened to ENV vars or just ENV. Okay. And going back to the OCI, the OCI runtime spec actually has an entire section, or okay, not an entire section, it's mostly just one line, that says for process configuration when starting a new container, the ENV key is used to define environment variables. Okay, so they support environment variables, and I think we all know that if you've ever launched a container, you can specify environment variables when you can launch that container. That's part of the specification. Every container that's OCI compliant every runtime will have to support environment variables, okay? Um, in case you're not familiar with what environment variables are, no worries, I'll just briefly describe them. Um, environment variables are, are defined kind of in the parent process and then passed along to children processes. Um, and all, process, all processes by default will inherit the environment of its parent, um, but that can be configurable, of course. Um, and pretty much every language or framework will provide access to the environment variable. So this is an example in Node where I'm just going to do a console log and to access the environment variables, I use the process.env um, object. And then from there, it's the name of the environment variable. So when I actually run this, I'll say export message equals greetings. And now when I run this script, it's going to populate process env that message with the, the value of message. Okay, so I can specify this this variable and I can uh, run it and it passes it along. And so I can use the same script now and run it in different places, just swap out the, the variable value and now I can run it in lots of different configurations. Um, obviously this is a pretty contrived example, but you can imagine doing this with um, larger types of uh, apps as well. 
So when should you use and not use environment variables? I know there's a lot of debate, but I'm a pretty big stickler about this. Um, environment variables are completely fine for changing options or labels or non-secret data. Uh, environment variables, for me personally, and I think a lot of other people will agree with this, is they should rarely be used for secret data. Um, so they shouldn't be used for your database credentials or, or that kind of stuff. And the reason why is because they're leaked too easily and too often. Um, I think, you know, there's a lot of third party scripts, especially if you're using like a error reporting or exception handling kind of stuff that they'll bundle up the a context of here was the environment at that time. Well, if that environment contains the environment variables, well, guess what? You just ship that off to a third party for debugging or, or that kind of stuff. Um, and as a, just a quick example, um, let's switch over to Vi Visual Studio Code here. I've got a Docker Compose file that's going to just start a PHP app and uh, have some environment variables with a database host and user and a password. And then my index.php, which is just super simple, is just going to do a PHP info. So let me spin this up real quick. And I will switch to my browser here. And I will refresh. And in case you don't know what PHP info, it just is basically a system dump of all the server configuration and everything. But if I go to environment, and if I kind of scroll through here, um, let's see, did I miss it? There it is. Okay, I went to the wrong environment. Uh, so DB password, well, guess what? It's it just printed my password out to the screen there, um, as well as my DB host and, and everything else there. So. Again, uh, and uh, like a lot of WordPress installations may make this available to system administrators or that kind of stuff. This environment variables just get leaked a little too often for my liking anyway. So um, that's why I, I really try not to use them uh, more than I more than I need to. Okay. So the other example is use files. Um, and this wasn't really a, a big thing that... Um, existed with Heroku who wrote the 12 factor app. And this is something that really containers made more accessible. Okay. So by leveraging mounts, uh, file system mounts, et cetera, we can inject files into containers and mounts are part of the OCI runtime spec. I know we do a lot of file mounting to mount source code in or, um, you know, persist data, et cetera. Uh, but we can also use it to provide configuration. And so by storing config in the files, we're no longer risking dumping them into our uh, environment variable dumps. And then the app can just pick up the, the file and, and configure itself from there. So the app will define, here's the structure of a config file, whether it's YAML or JSON or TOML or properties file or whatever. Um, it says, here's how you can configure me. And then you somehow make that file available. And we'll talk about various mechanisms to make files available to containers, okay? Um, so using files, a lot of times you actually you may actually see a combination of environment variables and files, and this is actually an example of that. So this is again a, a Node script. So going back to the JavaScript, and this git config is saying I'm going to look for the presence of a an environment variable maybe named config file path, and if it's there, I'm going to go ahead and, and require that. So if it's a JSON, it'll automatically parse it and return it as an object. Um, otherwise, I'm going to fall back to a default. And so when I use the default, I get the the host name of Mongo. Um, otherwise, if I provide this config JSON, I set the environment variable and now run it. Now I get a different answer for my host name and it, and it read it from that config file. Um, you know, you don't have to use an environment variable to say, hey, here's here's the, the path of the file, but that gives you even more flexibility of where your files can live in your container. Um, and we'll talk about some other frameworks um, in a minute that maybe prescribe, here's where to drop your config and, and that's fine too. Um, so there's there's not necessarily any right way, but even using this path, if I leaked my environment variables, all it gave me was the path to the file, but not the details itself. So you're still safe here in case your, your uh, environment variables are leaked. So let's talk about how to actually get files into containers. Um, there are several mechanisms for local development. Just use file mounts and uh, you can do a Docker run with a dash V for, you know, for a volume and mount in a volume or Docker compose as well. Um, when running with orchestration, so whether it's Kubernetes or Swarm or ECS or whatever, you can use uh, config or secrets um, and they will make it easy to, to provide configuration in 
the orchestration, whether it's secret or config, and mount that. And we'll see examples of that here in just a minute as well. Finally, configure your environment for what's easiest. So going back to my original slide of, or my original thought of, I, I deploy in Kubernetes, therefore I must d develop in Kubernetes. Well, unless you're writing Kubernetes controllers, you're you're running a lot of overhead for something that you're really just wanting to run a container. Um, so think about what what makes sense for the environment that you're running in. Um, so if you're in development, just use containers, use Docker Compose, use something that's much lighter weight than a full on Kubernetes cluster um, and, and local in your local development. And this sub bullet point, it's perfectly fine to have different YAML or manifest for local development than it is for, for your production, your deploys. You're typically gonna have to change various config. You're not gonna be able to use the same YAML document for local development as you do for production. And, and that's fine, okay? Um, that's perfectly fine. So secrets and orchestration, secrets are, are typically stored within the cluster um, and they're stored encrypted at rest, blah, 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 blah. And then they're provided only to the authorized containers. Um, and to an app, it's simply just a file that somehow magically appeared, okay? And, and pretty much or, every orchestration framework, that file will be in a tempfs volume, which means it sits only in memory and it will never actually touch the file system. Um, and so this is what it looks like in, in the Kubernetes API. The kubelet, the agent that runs in every node, when it is told, to, hey, run a pod, it gets the secret for that pod um, and puts it in a volume, which then is mounted into the pod. And this actually lets it, and Kubernetes does a swarm doesn't do it this way, but if the secret value was to be updated, it would update the, the file and the volume. So then the pod can get the updated secret without having to rotate the, the pod or restart it. Um, so there's some kind of nice things that, that come along with that as well. But again, it's just a volume out. Um, and that volume is being populated by the, the orchestration agent that's running um, on the node. And it's the same thing with, um, with Swarm as well. So external config, if, if you need to get config or secrets from something that's not running, or from secrets that aren't in the cluster, how do you do that? Well, we can do that by using um, a couple different methods. Init containers or sidecar containers are two of the most popular, um, or you can have startup scripts within your container that go out and fetch the secrets and, and whatnot. As a quick just demonstration of the difference between these, init containers are basically startup containers that may go and fetch secrets or configuration or do some stuff and, and populate a volume. And you may have one or in containers and populate a volume. And then finally, that volume is then provided to the, the main container that will actually start. So imagine one of these is getting secrets from secret store X, puts it in the volume. When the main container starts, it doesn't know how those files, how those secrets showed up. It just knows, okay, hey, I, I've got a file here and I'm going to read it and I'm going to go. So it allows you to decouple your application from your secrets management and secret store, which is really awesome. Um, so init containers run in order and then your main container will run after all the init containers are done. Sidecar containers run concurrently and the config container may sit here and it may watch for changes and update the volume as changes to the secrets or config or, or whatever is going. Um, again, you can make it do whatever, but um, Sidecar containers are running side by side, just like you know a motorcycle sidecar. Um, they're they're going along with the container uh, versus init containers, which run and run and run and they run and then are done um, before the main container starts. Okay, so let's look at an example app here. We still have a couple minutes to to do this, and uh, this example app might look familiar. I'm actually going to be leveraging the the same front end code of the Docker tutorial getting started uh, tutorial, but I'm swapping out the back end with a Spring Boot app just to show a, a different framework. And so we've got a, a React front end and then a Spring Boot back end that's going to be talking to Mongo. Okay. With Spring Boot, it's actually got some opinionated sources that it can look for config. Um, so it, it has a config and application properties file that's bundled within the, the jar file, but it, then it will also look in a couple other locations at startup. So to look for a config subdirectory of the current directory. So wherever the jar is, if there's a config directory, it'll look for an application properties file there. Um, or then the current directory or the class path or the class path root. So there's several different places that it can look at and they, they go in order of, of precedence. So if, if I find something in this first one, it will take the greatest precedence over all the others, okay? 
Um, and so we can use this to our advantage. Um, this Spring Boot already has configuration in mind, and uh, that's one thing that makes it really awesome here. So running locally, what might this look like? If I want to run this locally, I could say I want to run this image, and all this code is available um, on a GitHub repo that I'll, I'll link at the end of this. But um, I've got an image here. I'm going to mount a config properties into the, the container at app config application properties, and it will use that. And maybe those application properties, maybe by default I'm running Mongo directly on my machine, but now this config properties is going to say, hey, point to this other MongoDB instance rather than uh, somewhere else. And then the client, I may need to reconfigure to point to the API at a different source or, or whatnot. And so we'll, we'll talk about configuring the front end in just a minute. Um, but again, running locally, I may just mount volumes in and, and, and the file. At the end of the day, it's just a file. The container knows it's just a file and we'll, we'll use it from there. If I'm doing this with Swarm, maybe it looks a little different um, because now I've got a little bit more orchestration and the container may be running on one of in nodes in my cluster. And so I don't know exactly where it's going to run and I can't just mount a volume. Okay. So the way that I can do that is I can enroll a secret. So I'm going to enroll a secret named app properties. The file is going to be this config properties. And then my, my app container will reference and say, I want to use that, that secret, but I'm going to put it at this place. So app config application properties. And so again, when my app starts up, it's just going to read that file. It's going to configure itself and it's going to be great. In fact, maybe we'll just go ahead and do a, a little demo of that real quick. And I'm going to switch over to um, Chrome here where I've got the the play with docker setup and i've got a five node cluster here a th three managers two workers and i've got the the docker stack config properties and config json and again i'll talk about how i'm configuring the front end in just a minute but if i do a docker stack deploy docker stack i'll call this dc 2021 and we'll wait for this to deploy Might have to pull some images depending on just which node it uh, deployed to. All right, so it looks like we're about good to go there. And if I open up the, the front end, okay, it starts up and I can say, I want to, uh, what are some of my to-do items? Uh, finish recording my talk <laughs> and I can save it and, and it goes. Now, so if I look at the config here, um, now for this one, I, I've changed the Mongo connection to be this. And my core's origins, I had to populate it with the domain that this Play With Docker instance is using. And so again, I'm able to configure where my front end is going to be. And if I look at the config.json that the front end is using, this is how I'm configuring where the back end is, is located. And again, I'll talk about that a little bit more in just a second. But again, I can use these same containers and now just reconfigure them for where's my front end, where's my back end, where's my database, et cetera. Okay, let's go back to slides. And with Kubernetes, I can do much the same thing. I can uh, mount my my secrets and uh, and say, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to create a secret that has my application properties. I'm going to create a volume mount and put it at, at this location and, and let it go. It works just the same way. Again, to the, to the container, it's just a file on the file system. So let me talk about configuring single page apps real quick. Um, <clears throat> it's important to think about where your config is in your, your application. And the goal is to externalize the configuration from the JavaScript. Um, one, once externalized, then the app can go fetch it from startup. And you could use a custom entry point or mount in the, the volume or mount in this configuration file. And we'll see what this looks like here in just a second. But what I, what I see too often are things like this, where in a maybe a React code, it's using process.env.api host. And that means that this will resolve at build time and get swapped in. And so then you're always stuck with whatever API host was at build time, and you can't change that later on, okay? Now, if, if you're doing server-side rendering and that kind of stuff, that's a completely different story. But if you're just building your assets and serving them statically, um, this this will bite you. And so one of the ways that you can solve this is now my what I did, and this is just a, a React example. When my app starts up, I fetch a config JSON that has all the 
the configuration that can change. So in this case, where is my API host? So I fetch that, and then I pass that config to my React app, which sets it in a config um, a config context. I say, here's the value. And then anywhere in my app, I can use that context to say, hey, give me the API host. So now when I fetch API host, it's really giving me this value. Um, so localhost 8080 slash items. And we saw just a second ago when I deployed to Swarm, I swapped that out to this crazy long Swarm, or the play with Docker name. And I can just reconfigure the app just by swapping out the config JSON. Okay. I don't have to rebuild my front end for all the different places that I might do my front end. Okay. So super powerful there. Um, so configuring with Swarm, all I have to do is swap out the, the sources. And uh, that's pretty much it. Um, the, the config JSON. And with, with Kubernetes, it, it's much the same way. Um, let's see. Yeah, I got time for one more demo here. Um, so if I, let's go to VS Code real fast. And running in, in, in Kubernetes, I've got a, a customized script here um, that will deploy all the, the stuff. Um, so feel free to, to try it out yourself as well. So let me apply all these. And what this is going to do is it's going to make it so if I open up app.localhost, sorry, client.localhost, and this may take a second for it to just uh, get started up here. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. There we go. Okay. Now, so what I did in this case, still starting up the back end, so maybe while it's doing that, the application properties, in this case, I'm actually connecting to mongodb.net. So I'm running a, a Mongo instance in Atlas, in Mongo Atlas, and uh, letting it um, be my back end here. And then what it's letting me do is, um, you know, as I save things, I've just reconfigured it to, to point to somewhere else, okay? And let's see if my, it's just taking a second for it to start up here. I'm doing a lot of things on my computer and texting the CPU a little bit. So, um, okay, so I see it connecting a little bit. All right. And now if I go back to Chrome and hit the back end, Still waiting for it. The logs are almost done. There we go. Okay. Now it's refreshing. And yes, I know I need to update Chrome, so don't get after me for that. Um, but okay, my items are empty. And now if I refresh my client and say, finish Mongo example and save, I can go to Mongo Atlas. And if I refresh this now, I should see a, a document here. Uh, finished Mongo example there. So I'm, I'm, I've reconfigured my app to point to a completely different place. In this case, I'm not even running Mongo in a container. Um, and I can swap out where my Mongo database is coming from. Um, so to kind of just recap, um, containers have standards, um, just like intermodal containers that allow us to configure how we connect to them and uh, make them portable and, and reconfigure them. Configuration is one of these mechanisms and we can use environment variables and files Again, leverage the files, the, the orchestration system that you're deploying in, as well as whatever you're developing in. Use what makes the most sense. Write once, configure to deploy anywhere. Um, all my source code is available at, at this uh, GitHub link. I'll, I'll tweet it out and all that kind of stuff as well. Um, and with that, I thank you. And uh, if you've got any more questions, feel free to reach out to me. I'm pretty much everywhere on the internet at, at MikeSir87. And uh, I'd be happy to get to know you a little bit better. And uh, Hope you enjoyed this talk and I'd love to hear your feedback as well. So thanks and uh, enjoy the rest of DockerCon. Bye.